transitioning into PM, especially if you're coming from a non-technical background. Um, and I want to talk about how you can develop some of those key skills and play to your strengths uh, and position yourself uh, in, in a way that the next product opportunity will kind of uh, give you ideal candidate for that product opportunity at companies. Um, I want to hit on once you do land a product role, what are kind of, you know, uh, what's a good framework for onboarding and, you know, making a good impression in that role. Um, it's a framework that I put together. It's uh, come in handy for me as I'm onboarding on the last two product management roles. So hopefully uh, there's some insights there for you guys. And then I'll close off with giving a glimpse into what's that look like at Salesforce and uh, or what it has been for me at least for the past year. Right. So as I was preparing for this talk, I um, did a little research and I talked to some of my peers to understand their experience getting into product management as well. And I came across one of these, uh, one of a blog post that Basically, I love this graphic because, you know, it, it basically stated, unless, you know, you're one of the few people who have a perfect CS degree with a perfect combination of a CS degree with an MBA, with, you know, the perfect consulting experience in the domain that you want to break into, uh, your path is probably going to be a little less direct, um, and it might look like one of the swiggly ones. So, that was my path to least into product management. Um, it was not, you know, I, when I was in school, we didn't have a course on product management, uh, no degree on product management. For brand management, but not product management. And so um, I kind of stumbled upon it and forged my way into it. And that's kind of what you're going to have to do if you're coming from a non technical perspective. So, a little bit about my journey. Uh, I started off, you know, in my earlier days when I was in middle school, high school, I used to love building websites. I didn't truly love coding necessarily, but I loved building websites and kind of putting content on there. And to do that at the time, there weren't so I learned HTML. And so, um, you know, I had this passion, but it was more of a hobby that I would do, you know, after, after school, at night. And I kind of forgot about that hobby as I went through high school and in college, I majored in business, uh, in marketing and finance. And so, kind of forgot about, you know, my technical passion, all of that. Um, came out of college, uh, started working in a marketing role, and one of the earlier marketing roles was at a company called General Mills. So they, have, um, they create cereal like uh, Cheerios and Cocoa Puffs, Cocoa Puffs, Crunch. And so while I was there, I worked on two brands, Nature Valley and Pillsbury. And for both the brands, I had to, my project for, for that time was how do you launch those brands in India, in a local market. And to do that, we had to do tons of ethnographic research. So um, I partnered with an agency where we had 12 different um, customers who were identified. We went into their homes, we tried to observe how they're cooking food and how they're preparing meals to understand, you know, what do they need in their kitchen. We thought these women who are preparing the meals for their family, what do they need in their kitchen that we could potentially deliver uh, to them in these brands. So that really laid the foundation for me uh, in terms of the customer experience and our customer research and how important that is in developing any product or any company that, that uh, you uh, that we set out to do. Um, and from there, I kind of came into my first foray into product, which was again very indirect, when I joined Liberty Mutual Insurance here in Boston as a voice of customer analyst. So there, I was uh, annually uh, analyzing 80,000 plus different data points of customer feedback, customer surveys, uh, web chats, sometimes listening to calls. And I was trying to gather customer insights that I could then turn into something meaningful that I could hand to my product. Uh, peers, basically. And uh, at Liberty, I also, during those two years I was in this capacity, I also um, understood what it means to prioritize production support bugs. So sometimes you know, your software call quality will not be top notch and you have to ship things fast and sometimes bugs will release into production. And so um, we at Liberty had a team that was managing uh, all those kind of bugs and, and fixes across the entire platform. Um, and so my job there was to prioritize uh, you know, how these things would get fixed and you know, which ones to go first, basically. And, and, um, so that was my, that taught me really well on, that taught me really well on how to take customer insights, prioritize uh, product ideas, as well as prioritize you know, enhancements, bug fixes, et cetera. Um, and I did mention at Liberty, I started off as part of their uh, e-commerce team, so they were managing um, the quoting application, and ten quoting application. So if you're trying to get a product quote, you go online, you go to mutual.com, you would land into our application. 
So uh, from there, I also managed um, teams that were focused on the claims portal. So if you, were, if you happen to have a model claim or a renter's claim, you would submit the claim and we would kind of um, build this portal for you where you can check the status of your claim. So those were my earlier product experiences. Um, and what was interesting was, um, you know, the way I transitioned from a business analyst to a U.S. customer to a product owner was because for two years I had already done a lot of the work that it takes that PMs usually do. And when Liberty Mutual, which is a company of 55,000 employees, they started on this massive digital transformation and they started popping up these scrum teams and squad teams. So they needed PMs to fit those teams and hold those teams. And so they, they knew I was doing this work for two years. It kind of resonated, it kind of you know, worked really well, and it was just kind of an easier transition to get into that product in the last So that's how I got my first opportunity. And so um, after being at Liberty for four and a half years working on the coding and the claim side, I, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of try something different, um, you know, something with a greater scale. At Liberty, we had probably four million annually of traffic in terms of unique visitors coming to our site. I wanted something a lot more in terms of traffic and volume. So I applied to a couple of different companies and ultimately landed at Salesforce, where I now work on their commerce platform and we power sites like Soria, for example, Sephora, we power their digital experiences online, and uh, you know, we have 600 million users, unique users on that product. So pretty, you know, went from kind of that small scale to, to this. Um, and it's a whole different ballgame because now I'm managing a B2B product, which we're selling to businesses. So um, there's some challenges and some new things that I'm learning along the way, um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. All right, so I talked about my journey to product coming from kind of a business angle, um, business analyst angle, but I asked around, I asked my peers, and some of the um, you know, common ways or stepping stones that I noticed of uh, getting into product were uh, you know, becoming a power user of the tool that you're trying to break into. So for example, um, one of my friends loves Spotify. She listens to Spotify day in and day out. She has it on her phone, on her desktop, on her iPad, and anytime they release a new feature, she's kind of one of those power users to know, oh, something is different, something changed. Um, she has a point of view on the tool, and uh, she loves their discovery feature, uh, which basically you know, plays your, it creates a new playlist for you every week. And so um, when you hear her talk about it, she's just so passionate, her face lights up. And though she's not a product, she's actually an artist um, in New York, you know, she would be, I think she would be kind of a great candidate for a tool like that because she's already a user, she knows the game of the tool, she knows what's working, and she, she's surrounded by friends who are also using the tools. So that's kind of, I think that's you know, becoming a power user on that tool. The same goes for if you're trying to break into like a B2B space, uh, so you're using things like, or if you want to break into, let's say, um, Google Analytics or Google AdWords as a tool, become a power user of that and then find maybe a way to kind of use that to your advantage. Um, customer support, this is also uh, an area I often see people coming through. So at HubSpot, I remember when I was applying for roles many, many years ago, um, coming out of college, HubSpot would hire, um, I think, a support engineer or support customer support um, service agents. And they would, they would have them in that role for a year, and then after a year or two years, you had the chance to kind of move for, uh, horizontally to other areas. Again, when you're in customer support, you're dealing with cases every single day. You know what's working for your customers, and by the end of it, you're probably like, "Hey, I want to go fix this problem that I keep seeing over and over." So uh, that's a great place to be as well. And then, as I mentioned, uh, my journey was always a customer business analyst, um, and then solution engineer. So one of my friends at Salesforce asked him, "How, how did you break into product?" And he, he said, um, "You know, he had, he did have a semi-technical engineering uh, degree, so he said I was working as a solution engineer for this product that he was selling." And after just going into multiple sales and trying to sell the product and realizing it and not being able to close the deal, he's like, you know what, I'm done. I need to go and fix the problem rather than keep talking about it to customers and trying to find ways around it. So now he's a new he product and he's fixing it. Uh, and then I listed a few others because I know uh, there are people who come from other backgrounds like US research, UI and designers. Um, those are also, there's also a lot of skills there that you can apply to. If you have any specific questions, we can definitely talk at the end about it or ask at the end. We can dive into those in detail. Alright, 
So before um, I dive into some skills, so I'm assuming that most people have no, you know, um, kind of what is product management, um, you know, what's your day to day uh, look like. But generally, for PM, you know, there there aren't any number of set skills. You kind of have to do it all. It's a very um, difficult job where you're kind of and this framework, um, it's from Roman Fischler, who's an uh, expert at product management. He has 15 years plus of experience and he gives, he consults a lot of companies and gives a lot of talks on it. So um, visit his website if you haven't yet, he's, he's great. And he has this framework where, you know, there's so many components that go into product management and you have this core, the core framework that you are constantly working through. And you have the supporting teams, that's the purple circle, so you have things like sales and support, um, project release management that are that are going to be supporting your product delivery. So um, these are all very important, but the four that I find are that have helped me at least in the last eight years that I've been in product. Um, I, I, I'll kind of go through each one, but the first is customer centricity. I've already done that for my background um, with POC, but um, I applied to roles at uh, Amazon and Google, and in all the interviews. The first thing they ask you before you even interview, they ask you, uh, you know, they, they send you an email with resources, and they ask you to go through the resources. And from Amazon, you have to kind of learn their um, their principle, leadership principles, they call it. The number one leadership principle on that is customer obsession. Everything they do starts with the customer, and that's why they're so successful and they can scale the way they do. And for Google, same thing. They have uh, tenets like that they call ten things that we know to be true that were I think written by first founders and CEOs, and they've, they've kept those and they're publicly available and they ask you to study those and even the Google, focus on the customer and all else will follow. So, you know, some of the leading companies in the world are doing that and in the insurance space where I came, came from, um, USA was kind of the uh, leader in, in customer experience. So, um, does anyone have USA insurance? Yes. <laughs> so USA is, um, and do you like it? Exactly, exactly. So they were kind of this <coughs> we just could not, you know, quite um, climb to because USA is, so it's insurance that was started by a group of uh, military um, uh, members and, you know, they, they, they couldn't get insured, at, this was in the 1920s, and so they decided, you know what, a group of us are just going to insure ourselves and, um, you know, we'll keep this pool of money and we'll help each other out. It has since grown to the company that it is. It has so many assets um, under management. But my, my point is that um, what they do is they, they one, call their customers members. So not policyholders, not insurance members. They, uh, they actually have their employees, um, uh, they've had their employees kind of prepare, ready to, um, meals that are ready to, so that they can get a feeling of what their customers or their members are going through. So it's amazing the extent to which the, these organizations will go for their employees to realize and understand um, what their customers are feeling and develop customer empathy. So as you're in your roles, um, if you're at, at, you know, at, at studying right now, or um, you know, if you're on certain teams, try to think about who your customers are who are consuming your product or service, and try to think about like what they're going through throughout their day. You know, are they, are, do they have any pain points as they go through the day? Do they have any pain points as they're using your product, start to develop that kind of thinking because it'll help you a lot when you're um, trying to bring it to PM. The second skill um, that was very essential for me at least was uh, clarity in written and uh, vocal communication. So as PMs, you're constantly communicating. So I put up there, it's, it's my metric at least, but 50% of my pie, my daily pie, is probably spent communicating in one way or another. It's probably greater than that, but it's just my take. Um, but, you know, if I'm not writing an email, I'm usually meeting with my team, my engineering team, trying to communicate a concept to them, um, or I'm meeting with customers, and that's a different conversation, or I'm meeting with my stakeholders and trying to say, trying to say no, but no, you know, in a polite and, and a firm way, assertive way. So it requires a different, you know, it requires you to be very clear in how you think, how you communicate, and it requires you to take a different um, communication method for your different audience. And so a few things that help me so uh, there's a book called Minto. It's, it's a book called The Pyramid Principle. It's written by Barbara Minto. Uh, it was recommended to me by my advisor. 
and um, it's helped a lot in terms of just kind of getting clarity and thinking. And one of the best principles of you can take one thing away from it is thinking like a almost like a tree structure. So you have your point one, um, and then you kind of have two like your sub points that break out of that point. So to give you an example, um, you know Boston's a great city to live. That might be your first point, and so you have a second sub bullet that says Boston is a great city to live because. Um, there are great universities, and then you can further dive down that and talk about other you know, things under that. So, kind of conceptualizing um, your, you know, your idea, your vision that way, and then being able to kind of communicate that through written and verbal communication will be um, very helpful in one saving you time as you communicate with your different stakeholders and just getting your point across correctly. Half the battle is just getting your point across and making sure the other person understood it, especially when you're working with engineering teams. Uh, so that book was really helpful for me. And um, another thing that, you know, it was, it was more of a personal challenge, but I'm very soft-spoken, so um, I had to kind of, you know, in uh, presentations that I give to customers or at a bigger audience, I've had to train my voice to speak from kind of my uh, dialect even you know, more broadly. Um, and so there are other apps that are out there that can help you train on that. There are apps that also help you train on uh, women words like um and like and so. So um, I've listed a few of those here, but those are the skills that will help you because you're, I'm not kidding, I mean, communication is like, there's not a day when I'm on, even when I'm working from home, somebody's paying me in Slack 50 times. So you just have to kind of learn those skills and um, it's something I'll put in as well as I go. All right, so third skill is, uh, I mentioned this a little bit before, but decision-making and prioritization. I know that that's a pretty broad bucket, but um, that's where my product production support days came into play, and if you're uh, in a uh, support role right now, or if you're in a role where you have a list of things you need to get done, uh, try to find a way to kind of draw the lines in that, and try to think of that list as like, what do I, what can I get out? What's my minimal viable product that I need to get out for this project or product to be successful? Draw the line somewhere, force yourself to draw the line. So um, what helped me was when we had bugs or enhancements, that's where kind of my finance background came handy because we had to do a lot of financial modeling or ROI analysis and uh, weigh you know, the, the pros and benefits of fixing something versus enhancing something else. Because you have a finite number of resources, right? You have a finite number of team members and you have to get so much done. So you just constantly have to use data, metrics, um, that's gonna become your best friend. Uh, I didn't hit on that as much, but you know, if your product has one key metric, it's usually really a, a great place to start and it'll help your, you and your team stay on track. So I call it kind of a true north metric. Um, at Liberty Mutual, in, in the coding side, that was uh, conversion. Someone came into our funnel, we just have to get them through. It was pretty linear, so it was easier to track. We just have to get them to quote, and from quote, we have to get them to bind the policy online. That was our conversion metric. Um, in the claims, uh, on the claims side, it was a little bit different because we were a cost center, so our metric was cost call to collection. So we, we want fewer calls coming into our call centers. We want um, we want to reduce the call average call length into our cost centers, um, and that was our true metric. So at Salesforce, you know, our, our we have again a lot of metrics, but I'm, I'm working on it. I'm trying to get to that. What's my true north metric that I'm going to gather and rally the team around? So as you're thinking about your products, your companies, your um, teams, start thinking about that, how you can rally your team around that true north metric, and then start showing that at your uh, demos, at your team meetings. Start with that um, and see how you're doing. Measure your team to that. Uh, and that will also help you prioritize and make decisions. It will all get easier once you're to buy that. All right, and last but not least, passion for technology. There are so many and abundance of resources for any framework, any coding language that uh, you want to learn. And um, so really ask yourself, I think, what uh, products do you kind of gravitate towards in your daily life? Are they business to consumer products or are they software products such as, or rather B2B products like uh, Google Analytics, um, you know, or, or even HubSpot CRM if you're using that, you know? So um, try to think about what excites you, what, what you gravitate towards. Um, do you like working on products that are more back-end, that are you know, building an API that you can surface to other companies? And, and then try to maybe, of course, take classes on it and uh, you know, learn basic coding in that language because that can kind of get you prepared when the opportunity comes. 
So some questions I, you know, I asked earlier in my career, I just kind of listed a few here, but uh, what are your favorite products that you use frequently, Uber, Lyft, Front, Uber, maybe your athletics? Um, what do you like or dislike about them? Are there any pain points that stop you from going further or completing your task as you open that product? Um, and then these, these two are interesting questions. So uh, in, many times in interviews, especially for like PM roles, um, they might ask you, okay, tell me about a product and then um, your favorite product, for example, and then they'll ask you to find the pain point and then you have to solve the pain, solve for the pain point in the interview. So one, you gotta be careful what you pick because you, you gotta kind of know, you know, what are the next questions coming and um, you gotta be able to answer it to think more broadly on, okay, what are my options? How can I solve for this? So, um, a, you know, CEO of Google might, or an interviewer at Google might say, hey, CEO of Google came to you, and he said, how do I improve Google Maps? It would be, could be a broad question like that. And you almost have to think out of the box and say, okay, well, this didn't work for me, and so I'm gonna try and solve that. Um, so just kind of think about, you know, think about, regenerate that passion and think about what are the areas and what are the products that you grab to. So, um, kind of all those those were the skills that at least were um, important for me as I was going through my career. Uh, and then what I did was I just kind of tailored my resume to highlight some of those skills. Um, and I remember last year around July, August, September, I started thinking about you know, applying to new roles. Um, September I actually started applying to new roles, and I did it in two phases. So I had applied to the new roles without making any changes to my resume. I had listed my experience, sent it out, got nothing. And then I read this book. Uh, it's called Cracking the PM Interview. I'm sure many of you have probably heard of it or read it before. Um, but there's a whole section on resume editing. Uh, and I literally went page by page and I edited my resume based on that. Uh, so there's some great tips in there, like um, less is more, obviously. Shorter is, is better in many cases. But less than 10 years of experience, there's no reason to have a resume longer than one page. Um, and uh, you know, 15 second rule. So a lot of times recruiters only uh, they only have 15 seconds to scan a resume. So you really have to make it pop out, which is why this is more. And you have to prioritize what content you're putting on that one page. Um, so some other things that they, uh, that, that uh, Gail in the book she had listed was um, bullet formats. So um, instead of writing kind of multiple lines of text, trying to keep one line per bullet. And 50% of your bullets should not move uh, to second lines, they should be one line. So if you can use that as kind of a framework. And then highlight your accomplishments, not necessarily your responsibilities, I think that's more generic. Uh, you can highlight um, met especially metrics and quantitative data. So even if you're working on a small area of a bigger platform or a bigger um, offering, uh, personally my opinion would be that, you know, say, talk about your accomplishments in that area, but highlight how it supports the bigger platform. So if it leads to the company generating 10 million in revenue, you could say that, you know, because of this piece, um, it was in support of the company's overall objectives of generating 10 million in revenue. So try to kind of highlight those um, items on your um, resume bullet points. As I mentioned, the four key skills that I talked through, I tried to highlight those on mine and I bring those out because I knew I had to make up for a uh, potentially non-engineering degree. And then um, in this book, there's also some really good examples of resumes pre and post. So I made all those changes, sent out the resumes again, and I think I got like probably 40% um, accept or response rate back. Um, there was also another thing that I did was I networked during that time quite a bit, and for most of the roles that I was applying to, I was um, I either had a referral through my network to a friend, and that helps too. Of course, if you have a referral, it, it, the chances of your resume getting reviewed, you getting a screener, is a lot higher. All right, so. Uh, that's kind of how you know how are some of how you can kind of position yourself when the opportunity arises at your current company to break into PM. So once you do land a product manager role, um, you know there are different types of product managers and different companies. Different product, different companies have PMs that do different things. It really varies. So it's hard to kind of create a framework that's one size fits all. But again, this is based on my experience, um, and it's just a framework. So. What I, do, what I do usually when I start a new role is I try to um, understand the company and culture. That's kind of the first and most um, important. You want to understand what are the business objectives, what drives the company, who are your partners. You kind of you want to get a good lay of the land. 
And that takes about, like, I would say, two weeks-ish. Um, obviously, trying to do the homework even before you start the company, before you accept the offer, because you know, it's, the more prepared you are, prepared you are the better. Uh, and then I'll dive into the product. So in the case of Liberty Mutual, I was running um, fake quotes on our development environments to understand what it feels like to, to uh, quote on our platform. I was submitting fake claims applications and checking fake claim statuses just to see what it would feel like. Um, and putting myself in the customer's shoes. And uh, now at Salesforce, I'm just constantly in our product. It's a B2B offering, so we have uh, merchants who are using our tool. So I'm constantly in there, playing around with things, trying to learn things. And it's very, um, it, is, it has a lot of, it's a very broad product, meaning it has many different product areas. So uh, I, that's why I put kind of one month, but it really depends how long it takes you on board on the product. I mean, if it's a broad product, it could take you months, for example. Um, so I hit on in-depth functionality, uh, technical architecture and foundation, you know, it's, it's hard to, it again really depends on your product, what your stack is like, so um, at the very minimum you should know what are your layers, so do you have a, a web layer um, in, your, in your product, which most products, software products do at least, um, do you have a database layer, and then what kind of powers the, the middle tier, even if you know that at a high level, you're good to go. Um, in many of these conversations with the team teams. So after you've learned the company, the culture, your product, uh, you can kind of move down to building a relationship with your team. I mean, product manager, product management is essentially, you're trying to get things done through influence. No one reports to you, so you, you cannot tell anyone to do their job. So it's really um, encouraging your team, building relationships and trust, and it, you know, ultimately it's going to be selling your vision to your team and your stakeholders. So, um, yeah, so I think that's where I probably invest most of my time, and that's why I put 12 weeks, you know, the whole 90 days, you're constantly building um, those relationships that are going to last for a very long time. Uh, understand your customers. Again, sometimes, you know, you want to understand the product before you go to your customers sometimes because you want to know what they're experiencing. Sometimes if you immediately start talking to, their, to your customers, you know, oftentimes they're power users of your tools, so they might know way more than maybe what you've been exposed to. So you just want to go into the prepared. That's why it's kind of further down, further along, but that's probably the most important part. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, you know, identifying your true north metric, and um, finally, and most importantly, your first 90 days are when you're the most fresh in a company, right? You come in unbiased, and you can develop a point of view on the product, on the company, um, and so it's a great time to kind of write down, you know, what, what do you think about it? What do you like? What do you not like? And, you know, build a vision even. Like, if a year from now I still own this product, um, you know, what would I want it to look like? So, just an example, if you were to um, be a product manager for Lyft and you joined, play with it on mobile app, play with it, um, you know, through other means. I think through Slack, I'm not sure if you can order a, a Lyft, but I know you can order Uber. So, play with it from different, you know, user interfaces, and then figure out, like, what is your opinion of all that? Do you think Lyft should be integrated with more tools? Um, you know, is it is it working as you expected? Do the maps work as you expected? And so you want to generate that point of view because it's going to help you, and um, that point of view will also help your company eventually because you're again coming in very unbiased um, and with a fresh mindset. Right. And and the. the Kind of the weeks and the timeline again. That's what you know. Typically, I give myself like a couple, two weeks here, twelve weeks. Um, that's what I give myself in each of these kind of areas. Um, but it totally varies. All right. So finally, to wrap up, I want to talk about Salesforce. Um, so I joined Salesforce uh, January of this year. So I've been there for about uh, nine months. And as I mentioned, I'm working on their Commerce Cloud platform. So Salesforce has. Um, different clouds, and the, the core clouds are really uh, the sales cloud, which is your customer relationship management tool, the service cloud, you have the marketing cloud for email management, and then you have the commerce cloud, which powers the retail experiences for many of our uh, online experiences for many of our retailers. Um, we also have um, things like integration cloud that works between all of these to connect the data. So a company like Adidas, for example, is a great example because they use our commerce cloud to power their app, their website, Reebok. Um, they also use our marketing cloud to send emails to you. So if you buy something, you'll probably get an uh, automated email, and that's powered by marketing cloud. They're also looking at some of the other clouds, and for them, it's so important that you as a customer 
make it through all of you know these these areas. Like the Adidas should know who you are um, when they reach out to you, and they should know when they've connected with you, and create a single view of of the customer basically. And so that's kind of our integration cloud that works um, across all platforms. So a day to day for me uh, for the last ten months or so has been. Um, interesting. So we are a global company, so I usually wake up with emails that are already in my inbox from EMEA and uh, uh, Australian uh, APAC. And so I usually go through those pretty quickly and then um, try to, you know, listen to podcasts on my way into work, usually e-commerce podcasts or product podcasts. Um, I try to keep a, a you know, thumb on what's happening in the industry and what maybe some of the uh, retailers are doing, some of our customers, some who may not be our customers, what are they launching. Um, for example, like buy online, pick up in store, both this is really taking off right now, and omnichannel customer service is taking off. And so I need to know, you know, I need to be a current on those news, so I'm usually kind of waking up on that first thing in the morning or listening to podcasts on my way in. Um, then my team usually has stand-ups between 10 to 11 every day. We never miss it. And it's 15 minutes, you gather with your scrum team, usually uh, give updates on what you'll be working on for that day and if you have any walkers in the way or if something is going to with a story or um, code is going to carry carry over to the next sprint or to the next few days um, we'll kind of talk about that in the standups uh, and then you know I'll jump into like today we had a, a customer interview where we actually showed um, the customer a working prototype of what we built for one of our features and so that was you know 45 minutes to an hour just going back and forth, working with my UX team who led the interview, um, and then my entire scrum team and I will gather and huddle in the room, listen to the customer insights, um, and that will be, let's say, for feature one. But at the same time, I may have lunch, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, but I'll move on to uh, you know, the second feature. So while you're working on feature one, which is about to go into market, and you kind of need to own that, you're trying to think ahead to next year also. What do you need to deliver? How do you need to position your teams for that? So I'll do some kind of vision work on feature two. So look at the industry, where, where is it going? Um, does this vision make sense? So I'll work on a deck to kind of, you know, I may have to present that down the road to leadership, so I'll work on a deck for this new feature. Um, and then maybe I'll close out the day with reviewing enablement documents for that first feature that's about to ship and launch, um, because you have to enable your support teams and your sales team and your solution engineering teams. Um, and we have to make sure that the message is consistent and if they get a question from the customer, they should be able to answer as well as I would or my team would. So a lot of work goes into, again, communication and enablement. Uh, and then Salesforce, you know, I didn't get a chance to kind of mention this, but we do um, something called VTO, which is volunteer time off. So uh, I'll speak to this in a minute, but Salesforce has this model where each employee is given 56 hours to volunteer per year, no questions asked. Um, and so we had a VTO activity just this afternoon for an hour and people just kind of gathered in the social area, um, you know, donated uh, for charity and then that was kind of our way of team bonding as well as um, doing something good for the society. And then I might close off the day with, um, I sit near my engineering team, so if they want to demo a few things to me that they've worked on this spread, they'll just call me over, I'll go to their desk and they'll demo a few of the features that I've been completing. So that's pretty much my day-to-day, my -day. it goes by very fast. <laughs> Um, but it's a lot of fun as I mentioned. And you know, uh, one thing I forgot to mention about Salesforce, it, it's probably one of the best companies that I've uh, ever worked for and possibly may ever work for. And the reason is because this quote that I put up there, um, our CEO, you know, he mentioned the business of business is uh, improving the state of the world. And it's one thing to kind of quote, but he actually um, you know, has positioned it and formed the company and rallied us behind that that vision. And so we have this one-on-one -on -one policy, which is you give 1% of your employees time to volunteering, you give 1% of your product to public, uh, to the public sector for free, and you give 1% of your profits um, as a donation. Um, so this is kind of ingrained in our culture, and you'll see it, you know, if you visit any Salesforce office, or if you um, visit any Salesforce event, um, Dreamforce is coming up, you know, one of our bigger customer events is coming up, and you'll start hearing about, you know, all the things we do. Our CEO also um, is big on Quality. So you'll hear he takes very bold stances as well on some of the uh, you know quality issues that are going on, um, and it's just it's really amazing. So you get to do great work and you get to work for a company. So um, that's a little bit about Salesforce and my day to day.
So just to wrap up, um, I made a list of resources that, again, have helped me throughout my uh, time in product. Um, I hope that some of these will come in handy for you guys as well. And um, yeah, I think that's all I had to share. So I can open up for questions if you guys have any questions. <coughs> How deep, if you could describe this sort of your day to day uh, level into the technical piece? Yep. Right? Like, how much do you not that you code, but how much yep. do you actually see it? Um, and to sort of what level is it yep. kind of layer two? Is it layer three? Kind of yeah. you describe it a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I have not coded in this job so far, so that's, that's kind of good news. Um, but, you know, there is a level of understanding that you need to have. So, um, we in my particular role, at least, in commerce, in the commerce area, we have the tool, we have the database layer, so all of the data stored in the database layer. We have uh, the application layer, which will have, um, you know, it'll, it'll be written mainly in Java, for example. And then on the top, we'll, we'll have the JavaScript layer, right, the front end layer, where your merchants are actually interacting with the tool. So um, I need to know how those work. Uh, well enough. I need to know how they interact, where some of the issues might be. Like I know, for example, um, working for us, the way we've implemented things, working in the JavaScript layer can be difficult. I've come to kind of learn what that means. So if I know that okay, we have to put this enhancement in, I know that it's not going to be a two-day turnaround. Whereas in my previous job um, at Liberty Mutual, we were building things in responsive React components. And so I knew that, okay, that's these are kind of modular components, so turning something around is like a couple days. So it's more of like having that intuition and gut of knowing um, when your engineering team tells you, hey, this is going to take a sprint, or it's going to take two sprints, you kind of know that, okay, I have enough knowledge that I can trust in, in that, um, what's the word, like that uh, estimate, for example, right? Versus just saying, if they say it's going to take three months, you're like, okay, but in fact, you know, they're just yeah. pulling their thumbs. So it's more of like, that's where the technical piece comes into play. But all of that can be learned, I think. Um, right now, we're pursuing um, an area that I don't have that much uh, experience into, microservices. And so I'm just reading up on it. I read books on it. I read blogs on it. I talk to people who've done it. Um, and actually, what helps is the most engineering teams are very open to helping you kind of learn. So they'll pair program with you as well. So you can literally pull a chair, sit next to them, and watch as they're going through the code. So day to day, you don't actually, um, you know, you don't need to be super technical, but it does help to know when you're starting to think about estimation of projects and delivery of projects. Does that help? Yeah. So I, as I'm hearing, it's predominantly timeline and exactly. the project management piece of the project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, you were talking earlier about this North Star metric. Uh, can you give an example of one that you use at Salesforce or sure. one on your team or yep. how do you find it? Yep, so typically in B2B software, I think the most common one will be adoption. Uh, so if you roll out a feature, you know, it might be within a big kind of air, you know, part of a bigger platform, let's say. So you want to know how often people are um, testing it out in the last, you know, 30 months, or sorry, 30 days in the last month. And then you might want to know engagement. So are they coming back and engaging with that? Um, is that teacher sticky enough to bring them back? So those are kind of two that I use in my marketing modules, at least. Um, then there's other things like, I think the, the, the true key in work metric for us is, are we helping our customers be successful, right? Is the being able to sell more or merchandise more because of the features that we're launching for them? That can be a little bit difficult to get because um, we don't always have access to their data, right? So right now we're focusing on adoption and engagement as kind of the two primary metrics. Yep. Yeah, I have based off the fact that you told about having you no know, targets but you still have inputs, like how do you like resolve conflicts, especially with the team? Like for example, let's say the UX is conflicting the DevOps some kind yeah. of logic. Yeah. And you have no target and they don't want to report to you, how do you like yeah. resolve scenarios? Yeah, yeah. So so, it's, um, so there's conflict, but there's also good discourse where they might conflict on ideas, which I actually appreciate in my, in my meetings because that way, you know, I want people to challenge ideas, each other's ideas in a good way um, to make the product stronger. So something like that, you know, if we're sitting in a, for example, that vision um, piece, right, we're working on this feature too, um, we're doing a lot of visioning work of like, 
here's what the market has, here's what we, here's our gaps, so let's come up with something. Um, I'll bring in the UX person in that meeting, I'll bring in my engineering team, and they might say, from a tech standpoint, why are we rewriting this? We don't even need to do this. But the UX person might say, you know, this just does not work for our customers. Um, and so unless you're gonna unless you're gonna give me a way to fix this without rewriting it, we're gonna rewrite it, right? So they could have conflicting opinions, and in that case, um, I typically, you know, my my best friend becomes the data and the customers, and so we'll do customer interviews, we'll um, we'll bring in pretty much snippets of those audio video snippets of customer interviews and play those back on the team and say, well, here's my audience, right? This is what we need to learn kind of, that that's one way of resolving the conflict. If you have more of like a personality conflict, I think at that point you just kind of have to take that up with the manager of either that UX team or the engineering team. Usually they know how to handle handle that. Um, can you walk us through what it looks like to, you know, to actually um, come up with a new feature, like from maybe development of the idea through the launch? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, so in my area for next year, we're starting to kind of plan of, you know, what what is our uh, backlog going to look like, roadmap going to look like, um, and I know that. Uh, I'll, I'll use a very real example, for example. Many of our customers have, well, they're running multiple commerce sites within uh, a single instance of their commerce platform, for example. And they need to be able to share many of the uh, like promotions, discounts, uh, marketing areas with multiple sites. So one customer might have 20 sites in Europe, and they have to kind of share everything across. So that's a pain point right now that I'm solving. Um, so as I'm looking at next year, the very first thing, I would gather all the data from our sales team, our um, customer success managers, who are kind of the account reps for these customers, because they're the ones who know they meet with the customers every month or every quarter, so they know what the pain points are, and they know kind of how the feature should be, or not should be designed, but what the feature needs. They know what the requirements are. So once I gather that, um, I will start to prototype myself. I'll look at what is in the market today, what's available. Um, and then based on that, I'll kind of, as I mentioned, generate my own point of view. I'll then bring, it, I'll bring in my UX person at that point, UX lead, and then we'll start prototyping together. Um, it's up to you if you want to involve your engineering teams at that point. It really depends. It's still very early. Um, but then once the prototype is done, we would, um, at that point, maybe we could kind of ask the engineering team to do a gut check. Is this, is this feasible? Like, are we totally missing the mark? Or with the current stack that we have, can we make this happen? And if, if you get kind of a green light from them, then go ahead and maybe have a few more customer interviews lined up. Um, get customer feedback. Is this, you know, get, get them to, to kind of give you either feedback on are you going in the right direction, or no, this is not going to work at all, or this is, you know, we're, we, we stopped waiting and we started using it tool to fit, fit that gap so we forget about it. So you need to get that feedback early on, otherwise you're going to waste your, your engineers, uh, engineering time, right? So after you do that, um, then you have to, at least at Salesforce many times, you have to sell your feature and your vision to leadership teams. It's kind of like a startup in that way too. Um, so if you need to do that, you need to you know, build your PowerPoints, create your story, and then get in front of the leadership team and say, here's what I want to do for next year. I need commitment from you and I need some X amount of headcount. Um, and after you do that, then you can go ahead and, um, so, you know, your teams would start kind of spiking on what it would take to build that, how many months, um, do you need to create a new tech stack, you know, they would kind of figure out the how. And then once you know the, the what, the why, and the how, then you can go ahead and start building. And then once you build it, um, then there's a whole other you know, element of, uh, once it's ready, I prefer to get it back again in front of customers, validate with them again before we use if it misses the mark, again, go back to the client board, it's good to go, and ship it, and then you have to do tons of enablement around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you mentioned APAC and EMEA uh, uh, collaboration. So, yeah. uh, how does the collaboration work uh, in uh, with the perspective of stand-ups and uh, basically in-person uh, communication? Yeah. Yeah. So, my product, my immediate product scrum team is based in Burlington with me. Okay. So, that is, um, I've tried different variations of teams. So I've had a team where I was here and they were in Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland. 
I had a team where I was here and they were in New Hampshire, so I would go up every two, three days, and then finally I have a team that's in place for me. And that's the model that works the best. Being co-located with, uh, with your peers is, is, is invaluable. So um, in EMEA and APAC, those are more um, the customer-facing teams. So they're usually the ones who are like the account managers for the customers there, um, and you know they'll probably they'll be sending feedback or they'll be sending uh, requests for information or maybe they typically what happens is they reach out to support and they reach out to uh, you know other channels where the customer wants to customize the platform in a certain way and the account rep can't figure it out and so eventually after trying different channels it'll come to the PMs right so after going through that. Yeah. I have a follow-up to that. Yes. Uh, do you feel that, that uh, the model that you just described uh, affects the turnaround time for the customer? Yeah, I think, it's, well, yeah, I think in, in B2B we see it less because we don't ship every single day. But I think if you're in business-to-consumer software and there was a, um, a bug in your impact region, yes, it's probably going to, you know, impact the time with the cycle, kind of like a circle, right? The most customer cycle. So by the time it reaches you and your team is able to debug and figure out what's going on and fix it, yeah. a whole day has gone by. You might have missed uh, um, so you had mentioned making uh, data and analytics your best friend. Yes. Um, I wanted to know if that's just something that works for you or you think it's pretty critical to succeed in the role itself. Um, so it's, it's definitely very, very critical. I was at a conference, part of a conference on Friday and one of the uh, breakouts was only on that metrics and coming up with your board star metric. Um, because I mean, of course, you want to know how your product does, but PMs are, I mean, generally measured to the success of their product. And if there's no quantitative measure, then it, it becomes hard to kind of, you know, say that, hey, I did well this year, or, or you know, really missed the mark on something. Um, so you need a measurable metric. And then, as I mentioned, rallying your team behind something, it helps a lot to put something quantitative in front of them. So you mentioned that uh, as part of PM role, uh, there is a lot of collaboration among uh, cross-functional teams. Yes. So uh, as you mentioned, like the engineering team is on other location. So how you uh, proceed with, like, how you build trust within the team? It's a great question. Um, it's a learning experience even for me. Um, but you know, I I can't obviously I've not gone out to those regions yet, so I, I have not met many of them in person. Uh, I think in that case, it ends up coming down to being responsive. I think that's probably the best way to show that you you value their time and their feedback, and that they're not forgotten. That's usually the first thing. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of times these customer-facing teams in other regions, they're requesting enhancements based on the local region needs, right? Which I may not be privy to. So I need to do my research. For example, in, in, in China, um, in retail, um, they like using something called a lucky draw promotion. It's, it's something we, we don't quite use here, but it's, it'll be like, you know, a lucky draw wheel, you spin the wheel, and you get one of the promotions um, picked out of the wheel. And it's a, it's a big way of selling. It's like a massive selling strategy over there. So, you know, I need to read up on that and understand what that market needs, because otherwise this, this enhancement might get dropped all the way to the bottom of our back. So I think that's another way. Um, when you start delivering, when you start responding, that's probably the best way you can show trust um, from such a far distance. Alright, All right. well thank you uh, everyone and uh, best of luck in your journeys um, in pursuit of the product.